Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to wrap up the modern atomic theory by blasting our way through the work of uh, three big scientists, De Broglie, Schrodinger, and Heisenberg. And that way we'll wrap up again sort of our mini modern atomic theory unit. And again, I'm, I'm certainly not doing this justice, but it's enough to get you started. And so by this time in modern atomic theory, the idea of the dual nature of light uh, became uh, widely scientifically accepted, if not uh, well liked. Uh, it's very confusing that the fact that light, depending on the experiment, could act like a particle or a wave. Um, but then, then came along uh, Louis de Broglie, and, and again, I, just, I love what this guy did. In his doctoral thesis, uh, he, he took the idea of the time and flipped it on its head. Everybody was saying, you know what, energy has the properties of particles. And then de Broglie said, well, wait a minute, well, why don't we just look at the other way? Why don't we say that uh, particles might actually have the properties of waves? And he said, well, let me, let me see if I can figure out the wavelength of a particle. And so he, he, he derives an equation, and, and again, don't worry about the derivation of this so much. Uh, but what he said that is that the wavelength of any particle could be determined as Planck's constant, over the mass of that particle in kilograms times its velocity. Um, now that's not frequency, uh, be careful about that. And so technically every object could have a wavelength, they're called matter waves. It's just that, I mean, if you look at that equation, you've got a very tiny number being divided by uh, probably larger numbers, which is going to make it even tinier. And so the idea is that most things have a wavelength that are going to be beyond the realm of detection. Um, de Broglie also figured out how to do crowd waves. Uh, True story, <laughs> or not. <laughs> um, now, this is a scientific curiosity, but sort of irrelevant for any object of, of any sizable mass. But what if we were to take a very tiny object like an electron? And so what he did is he said, okay, well, let's, let's try to find the wavelength of an electron. We've got the information about the electron there. We know its mass is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28th grams. We can convert that easily to kilograms. We know its velocity. And so we can plug it into this equation. It looks like a beast, but it's not that bad. Remember that joules are kilograms meter squared over second squared. And so if you change all that around and cancel it out, you end up with meters. Uh, something to the tune of 0.1 nanometers would be the... Um, uh, wavelength of an electron, and that ends up being about the size of an atom, which is somewhat interesting. De Broglie's ex uh, work was experimentally verified by two guys, one of which was J.J. Uh, Thompson's son, and he would quickly win the Nobel Prize for that, and the other guys would win the Nobel Prize quickly after that. And as I understand it, if I remember correctly, De Broglie might be the only one who's ever won a Nobel Prize based off his doctoral thesis, uh, which is again pretty crazy. Um, now, now that we have the idea of, of electrons possibly having a wavelength, along came a guy named Erwin Schrodinger. Uh, and, and Schrodinger, did, again, did, did some crazy neat stuff too. <coughs> he said, okay, well, well let's, let's run with this. Let's assume electrons have a wavelength. Schrodinger knew there was things called standing waves, and I'll link it to a video of this below. But the idea of a standing wave is uh, if you have the right di uh, distance for your wavelength, uh, the wave will no longer look like it's moving back and forth. It'll look like uh, the, o the nodes and antinodes will simply be moving up and down. There'll be no horizontal uh, visible motion, and that's called a standing wave. And only certain lengths will get a standing wave based on the wavelength. And if you wrap that around into two or three dimensions, there would only be certain circumferences or distances where you could get a standing wave also. And again, that's a little tough to visualize. So. I don't know if I try to visualize any of this, but the idea is that uh, Schrodinger said, okay, well, this would actually explain uh, Bohr's allowed energy levels. Because if electrons could only exist where they set up a standing wave, then there's only certain distances where electrons can exist. And so electrons can't fall into the nucleus because under a certain point, they can no longer set up a standing wave. So it's really kind of neat that uh, Schrodinger built off the work of de Broglie and de Broglie built off the work of other people uh, so that uh, we really have a viable model of the atom that explains this weird idea of quantum uh, energy levels and quantum leaps. And again, I'm certainly not doing this justice because what Schrodinger did is Schrodinger built his work off of uh, very complex mathematical equations um, called wave functions. And we will not go into any of this there, but... Uh, you know, so the idea is that there's a lot of work behind this. And the wave functions had certain places called orbitals, where you'd have mathematically a 90% chance of finding an electron. And there's also a guy named Max Born that was in here who did a lot of stuff with probability waves and things like that. Um, but again, I'm going to oversimplify this to a bee around a flower. 
And so if you were to take pictures of a bee buzzing around a flower and superimpose them on each other, you'd have a good idea of where that bee would be. Now, you don't know exactly where it is, but you'd have a good probability of where it might be located the next time. And so you could set up a probability map. Now, that bee could technically be anywhere. Um, so you're never quite sure exactly where it is. But, nonetheless, uh, you'd have an idea. And so you get something that kind of looks like a cloud. And if you are actually up in a plane and you look at a cloud, the edge of the cloud is not a clear edge at all. And, and so if you wanted to draw that, though, at some point you'd have to say, okay, well, there's the edge of the cloud. And that's what orbitals really are. Orbitals are where there's a 90% chance of finding an electron. And that's why these, um, the modern view of the atom is sometimes called the electron cloud model, because you know, there's this fuzzy sort of area of space where you might find an electron. And so the idea of the electron cloud model is that you know, we deal with these things called orbitals, where there's a 9 out of 10 chance of finding an electron. And that idea of 9 out of 10 is going to be really important. Uh, because the idea of electrons being able to exist between orbitals is going to allow us to have these kind of quantum leaps. Um, Dirac, Paul Dirac, experimentally verified this. Um, uh, Schrodinger uh, joins a long list of people who eventually ended up hating what he discovered and hope there wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't like the way that it got used later in physics. So we'll wrap up today uh, talking about the work of uh, Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg, very interesting man uh, in his own right, did a lot of work for uh, the atomic program, Germany's atomic program in World War II. And uh, there, there's a principle in physics, uh, in quantum physics, called the uncertainty principle. And that's the idea that uh, there are certain complementary uh, variables. And so it, there are fundamental limits about how you can know these. To give up, to know information about one, you have to give up information about the other. You can't know exact information about both precisely. And Heisenberg uh, is given credit, and that's why it's sometimes called the Heisenberg's principle, uh, that uh, you cannot simultaneously know the position and the momentum of uh, particles such as electrons. Uh, to, if, if you know one precisely, then the other one is by default uh, imprecise. And, uh, and again, I'll try to link to some videos at the bottom to explain this in a little bit more detail with some neat demonstrations. And it's just one of the quirks of quantum mechanics. Once you narrow down the information about one, the other one becomes imprecise. And so uh, Heisenberg would end up winning the 1932 Nobel Prize for this. Now, uh, Heisenberg's principle is often confused, and I've, I've certainly been guilty of this myself, uh, with the thing called the observer effect. And that's the idea that uh, the very act of, of observing disturbs the system. And so, for instance, uh, let's say I were to shine a, a light on the hippo. Um, hippo's not going to go anywhere. So uh, let's, let's have this electron fire photon out at this uh, hippo. The hippo's massive. It's not going anywhere. But if the hippo were to return the favor, uh, that photon would end up uh, changing where the electron was. Um, because we're trying to detect things with electromagnetic radiation, and the electromagnetic radiation is going to change the location of, of that electron. And so it, it's easily confused. I can certainly understand that. And again, I've been guilty of that myself. Um, but the observer effect is actually quite different than the uncertainty principle. Uh, the uncertainty principle happens whether or not anybody's observing. It has nothing to do with us trying to detect something. This is simply a nature of quantum mechanics. Any wave-like system is going to have an uncertainty principle to it. And so there's really no need for an observer at all. And, 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 and they even go on to define this as really any system where you have any kind of uh, interaction between the quantum physics level and the, and the classics mechanic level, so you're going to run into this uncertainty principle. Um, but, but it's not Heisenberg's uncertainty principle necessarily uh, when it comes to the observer effect. So even though Werner Heisenberg said the very act of observing disturbs the system, uh, the, the uh, observer effect is different than the uncertainty principle. But of course, you certainly can have uh, Heisenberg's homework uncertainty principle, where you can say that you've determined the uh, momentum of your homework so precisely that you are no longer certain of its location in the universe. Should, should get you out of at least one homework assignment. <laughs> um, before we go and go on to some of the uh, quantum numbers and, and, and other ramifications of modern atomic theory, I thought it might be nice to uh, show you that, oops, show you that Solvay conference right there. Look at that, greatest picture ever. Uh, there's so many people in there uh, that are important to uh, modern atomic theory. I, I won't, I won't go into all of them. I don't, I don't know all their accomplishments. But we got people like Compton, Dirac, uh, Einstein, De Broglie, De Broglie uh, Born, Bohr, uh, there's Schrödinger, Heisenberg, Pauli. <laughs> there's a little guy named Einstein in there. You might have heard of him. Uh, Marie Curie, Max Planck. 
Uh, greatest picture of all time. I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but anyway, uh, that's uh, more for exploration later. Maybe I'll have a video sometime that, that hits all these guys' big points. Um, but thanks for watching, and have a great day.